in quatque voxque sue, ergo premat flavias, digitoque silencia signet, et sese parium vertat in hapocratem. Which is to say, when he's silent, the fool differs no whit from the wise, it is tongue and voice that betray his stupidity. Let him, therefore, put his finger to his lips and so mark silence and turn himself into the Egyptian Hippocrates. What do you say to that? What it means is if you don't know what you're talking about, if you keep quiet, nobody knows that you don't know what you're talking about. So that's the end of this presentation. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> This is an example of one of the emblems from Andrea Alciato's Emblematum Liber, which was first published in 1531. And the way it works is that there will be a motto, in this case silentium or in silentium, in silence. There will be a picture. And what we have to do is put the motto and the picture together. They're not illustrating each other, they're interacting and then try and work out what the message is. And the message will come with the text at the bottom, which we call the subscriptio. So it's a three-part interaction of text and image. Can you tell us a little bit about how we got there? Yes, so in 1531, Alciato was a scholar and a lawyer, and he wrote poems to his friends, that's how they occupied their time. And he sent some of these poems to one of his friends who showed it to a publisher. How interesting these are, they're so visual, these, these poems, they've got a, a title in the poem, they're so visual, so evocative. And the publisher thought, this is really interesting, and he decided to publish them without even Alciato's knowledge. And not just to publish them, but he thought they are so visual, so appealing, that he asked an engraver, we don't know who the artist is, asked an engraver to create pictures for some of the emblems. Um, and so had this pirate edition come out. Now, in one way, Alciato was quite angry, quite upset about it, not just because it was a pirate copy um, of his work, mostly because images were se visual images were seen to be not as sophisticated or scholarly as having the text in Latin with classical references. Um, so he didn't quite like the images, but eventually warmed up to the idea, especially because of the success Thousands of books were published, of emblem books. So it did quite well out of it, and other people, and in every culture, Western culture, and even later in the Americas, and in Asia started appearing emblem books. So it became a very popular language to have, um, to have with you, that you understand visual elements that were around you and people used to interact, and people would carry them. So if you come, if you come to Glasgow University, special collections, you'll have a look at some of our emblem books, you'll see some of them are no bigger than that. Um, and because they were literally pocketbooks. People would carry them and meditate and think about things whilst they were reading them and, and, cons and, and weaving considerations about them. The other important thing about emblems is why do we call them emblems? Nowadays, when we think about an emblem, we think you know, of your football club's logo or, um, or something like that or your, the Scouts logo, so that's what people, people call an emblem, or life is emblematic, meaning it's enigmatic. But what an emblem originally was, was in fact, it's a Greek word that means a mosaic. It's a mosaic of meanings. There people that used to refer to an emblem as, um, for instance, the engraving on the back, of, on the top of the spoon, where you would have dedicated to so-and-so, on the birth of so-and-so, for instance. So that engraving could have been made of tiny wee stones, so lapis lazuli, ruby, whatever, and every stone has a meaning, and the whole engraving, looking at the whole engraving, you see also a picture of a heart. But the, the elements that compose that heart have a meaning. So it, it is a meaning upon meaning that con con it creates a visual image that strikes immediately for what it is. So emblems, so these poems, which become as epigrams, uh, acquire the name emblems and become a genre. So Alciato created a literary genre in 1531 with his emblem. It was so popular. Alciato's book, his <coughs> book of emblems, went to well over 100 editions, of which we've got more or less everyone at the university in Glasgow. 
Now an emblem gives you a general truth, so if you don't know what you're talking about, keep quiet. A device, on the other hand, 